to open your Bibles with us to the book of Isaiah. And I found this verse of Scripture interesting. I, I've thought on this verse several times in the past. I don't know that I've ever preached on it here. But we want to look at Isaiah chapter 4 and verses 1 through 2. Isaiah chapter 4 verses 1 through 2. And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. And so it speaks here in that day. Now this refers, I believe, to a future time, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the uh, Salvation, restoration of Israel uh, that is spoken of in the scriptures, especially that at the end of the tribulation period uh, when they will be delivered and Jesus Christ will be revealed to them as their Savior and they will turn to Him in faith and the establishment of the millennial kingdom. But this first part of this verse, there's a few things we want to look at. In that day. Now what a picture this is. The seven women taking hold of one man. First of all, I want us to think about who is that one man. And I believe that is Jesus. Verse 2 speaks of the branch. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious. And we know in Scripture, Isaiah chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 5, uh, the branch is a prophecy and reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 5, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after his sight, or after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And again, we see a reference uh, to the return of Christ to the earth as the King of kings and Lord of lords in that statement. Um, in Psalms 80, see another... Psalm 80, beginning with verse 14. Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and behold and visit this vine and the vineyard which thy right hand hath planted and the branch that thou thyself made strong for thyself. Uh, it is burned with fire, it is cut down, they perish at the rebuke of thy countenance. Let thy hand be upon the Son of Man, of thy right hand, upon the Son of Man, whom thou madest strong for thyself. Now we know that through the Gospels, Jesus Christ is referred to as the Son of Man. I believe the idea of the branch is a reference to the deity, to God, Jesus Christ himself, being made flesh and dwelling among us here upon the earth. And so, uh, again, we see this reference to him as the branch that thou hast made strong, the Son of Man whom thou hast made strong for thyself. Uh, 
And so, there, uh, in our text, I believe the one man spoken of here uh, is uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there is to be a time uh, when seven women shall take hold of one man. Um, now we have identified the one man, but who are these seven women? Now the text indicates, I believe, a marital arrangement. Called by thy name. You know, traditionally, a lot of people today seem to be breaking with tradition. But traditionally, and it goes back, I, I don't know how far, I'm not going to make any statements here. Let me uh, go back. The object of reproach is the title of our message. Um, and these are the scriptures. We've already gone through a few of these. Um, the scriptures are going back to the, the tradition that when a man takes a woman to wife, she takes his name. She becomes identified by his name. Um, we see in Acts chapter 11 that the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. They are identified after his name. Acts chapter 11 verse 26. Uh, verse 25, then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And so we see where the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, particularly we see here in the context of his church, are identified by his name. And all through the scriptures, we see the phrase that Jesus, in teaching his disciples, in teaching his church, has described that they do these things in his name, or as he is authorized. And, and so in his name implies authority, that they're acting under his authority and in his name. And so, and this authority he gave to his church, and uh, we see that uh, his church, the disciples, were called Christian, or after his name, first at Antioch, and in 2 Corinthians, I, I'm, hopefully I am not stretching the scriptures in making this conclusion, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, And begin with verse 1, he said, Would to God ye would bear with me a little in my fall, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Uh, so he, he says here, uh, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom, you have not, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And so he uh, makes the... Uh, illustration here and the comparison that as a church they have been espoused to one husband and that is Christ and so we are espoused or engaged unto him uh, promised in marriage that marriage is to take place in heaven um, and so we see here 
that he has one wife. In Revelation 19, and verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. Now Paul said, when this church was established, it was a spouse that is given in marriage, promised in marriage. It's like they're engaged. They're not married, but they've been promised in marriage. And so this time uh, here on the earth until he returns for us is that engagement period. And so here we see where the marriage of the Lamb is taking place. Marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And notice, it said his wife, singular, not wives, plural. His wife hath made herself uh, ready. Now the text would indicate that seven women, and I believe... This is, in reality, a reference to false churches, church systems that want to claim legitimacy or marriage uh, to Christ. But Christ is no bigamist. He's not married to seven women. He's married to one, and that's his church. Uh, that has been espoused to him. But there will be a time when seven want that honor or want the legitimacy of that claim. Now notice what they say because I think this is part of the description. This is part of the explanation. So we want to be called by your name. We want to be legitimized. Nevertheless, in scriptural, scripturally, the relationship between husband and wife. The husband, and, and we'll read some of this in, in Ephesians chapter 5, where he discusses the relationship between the husband and wife and, and goes on to say that that is a parallel to uh, a, and a type of the relationship between Christ and his church. And, and, and the husband is to love his wife and to give himself for his wife. The husband provides for the wife. The husband clothes the wife. The husband feeds the wife. He takes care of her and provides those things for her. He is to love her and cherish her as Christ does his church. But now these seven women say, we want your name. We want to be legitimized, but we'll provide our own bread. And we'll provide our own apparel. Those two things that it mentions here. Well, provide our own bread. What is that? Doctrine. Think about this. Matthew 13, 33. Matthew 13, 33. One of the parables given there concerning the kingdom of heaven, concerning this church. He says, Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Leaven. In Matthew the 15th chapter, let's take this in the order as it appears in his teaching. And verse 9, he says, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. He says, In vain they worship me. Because instead of teaching God's word, instead of teaching God's doctrine, His teachings, they're substituting the teachings of man and saying, This is of God. This is God's word. Matthew 16, verse 6. 
Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Beware of the leaven. Here's a woman that hid leaven. Now why is she hiding it? Because leaven's not supposed to be in there. It's supposed to be unleavened bread. But she's hiding the leaven in it. And that hidden leaven is going to corrupt the whole loaf. Beware the leaven. And what does he say? Verse uh, 12. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Leaven is a type of that. And what was that? You teach for doctrine the commandments of men. It's leaven. And so, when we talk about we'll eat our own bread, we'll supply our own doctrine. I think I got a note in one of my Bibles that says, we're our own translation of the Word. But primarily the idea is the teaching and what is taught. We'll teach what we want to teach, but we want to be identified with you. 1 Timothy 4. And, and we see the, the teachings, the warnings here, that this is what's going to happen. 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Uh, the faith here, it's not just depart from faith or walking by faith or living by faith, which is that trust and confidence in the Lord. But here faith uh, is a reference to that body of doctrine, the teaching that has been delivered, that we're to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. And so uh, they uh, shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. See here again, doctrine. The doctrines of devils. And he describes it, speaking lies in hypocrisy. He goes back, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is uh, their doctrine. And in another place it talks about, uh, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. It is their hypocrisy. Hypocrisy and false doctrine go together. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with the hot iron, forbidding to marry. Now, what religious system does that? Just think for a minute. Which religious system, as a doctrine, forbids? their ministers to marry. It's called celibacy. And commanding them to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received. To now there's another, there's another outfit that promotes being vegetarian as a doctrine. So we see a religious systems coming into existence that claim to be churches of the Lord Jesus Christ, but, and they want the legitimacy of being, we're, we're a church of Jesus Christ. Some will even incorporate that phrase into their name, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They have their own translation, their own doctrine. Anyway, uh, 2 Peter. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. But there were false prophets also among the people. Talking about in the Old Testament. So there were false prophets. 
uh, also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Talk to the believers, talking to the churches. He said, there are going to be false teachers among you. Now, I don't have this in my notes included here, but in Acts chapter 20, Paul speaking to the elders of the church at Ephesus, he says, I know after my departing, grievous wolves are going to enter in, not sparing the flock. And of your own selves, men will arise and teaching perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. So when he talks about a departing from the faith, it's because of these wolves in sheep's clothing, heretics, those coming in, teaching false doctrine, perverting the, do perverting the doctrine of Christ, perverting the gospel, perverting the truth about God's Spirit, and leading away disciples after themselves, and so some will depart, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And so and it goes on to say, And there shall be false teachers among you who shall privily, shall bring in damnable heresies. What is that? That's that woman hiding the leaven in the meal. Privily or secretly. They're hiding it. They're not coming out in the open and saying, Look, I'm a heretic and I'm teaching false doctrine." They're not going to say that. They're going to come. God's called me to preach and He's given me this message and this is from God's Word and it's going to be heresy. That's what he says there in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He goes on and talks about these are ministers of Satan who... Uh, transform themselves. That is, they take on the appearance as ministers of righteousness. But they're Satan's ministers. And they're bringing in the damnable heresies and the doctrines of demons. These are those whom he refers to as seducing spirits. Even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many, verse 2, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. They're going to gain a following. And where is this following coming from? In the Lord's churches and His people. See, this is not happening out there somewhere. It's happening in and amongst the Lord's churches, New Testament churches. I want to be careful. I don't want to say, this is happening in here. That's the reason I admonish. Don't believe something. Don't believe anything because I say it. Because you hear it come out of my mouth. Sometimes I have a case of dyslexia and I switch names and things around and and most of the time you catch those things and correct me. But primarily we're talking about doctrine. Don't believe something because the pastor is up here saying it. And he's taking this book and saying it. We talked about that a little bit this morning. But be like the Bereans. Go home. Get out your Bible. Check it out. Make sure that what I'm saying is according to the Word of God. The Spirit that dwells in you, that teaches you, and the Word of God speaks to you. If there's something false coming that you're hearing, it should raise some red flags in your mind. Check it out. Don't assume. And I apply that to myself because once we, at any time, we start thinking, well, this is our preacher and He's not going to lead us astray. He's not going to teach us false doctrine. That's exactly when churches get into trouble. Anyway. Uh, and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom? 
by reason of these false teachers and those that begin to follow the way of truth it shall be evil spoken of so when someone is getting up and preaching the truth they're going to gang up on them and speak evil of them the truth will be evil spoken of so thus the spreading of corruption, false doctrine, we're warned about, which led to an apostasy of the churches in history. We've taught on church history, and, and you pray for us, uh, Lord willing, we've kind of firmed up that in the last week uh, in March, I'm supposed to go down uh, in Kentucky and be preaching there a series of messages on our history and heritage of the Lord's churches. Um, but we see there was an apostasy that occurred from the times of the apostles and coming down that resulted eventually in the formation of what today is known as the Roman Catholic Church. But it was not known as the Roman Catholic Church in those early days, but it was still a false and apostate religious uh, system. Because he warned that those that do and do not repent and, and return to the original uh, preaching and teaching of God's word, he said he would remove their candlestick, Revelation 2, 5, 2 verse 5, Revelation 2 verse 5, that he would, except they repent, he would come quickly and remove the, can, his, the candlestick out of his place. And I believe that is a reference to the indwelling, empowering presence of the Holy Spirit upon the church. And when we're talking about the church, the church is the Lord Jesus Christ as one institution, but a church is a local congregation. It's not some universe. It's not the family of God. The term family of God covers all the saved. That's the family of God. That's not the church. The church and the God and the family of God is not the same institution. It's not the same thing. A church has a, a different function and all. It's not the kingdom of God. Uh, but uh, we see that a church is a local congregation or assembly of believers. But anyway. Which became, as we follow that down through there, Satan's counterfeit Christianity. He talks about the synagogue of Satan. He talks about the seat of Satan there in the letters to those churches. And finally in Thyatira, he talks about that woman Jezebel. And I believe that in verse 20, that woman Jezebel is a reference to the developed the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy, which is an anti-Christ organization. It is a counterfeit uh, to the church that Jesus established. It is not uh, his church. And to her children, her harlot daughters, in verse 23. And I made a note, the original, the Catholic Church, and the original Protestant organization. The church that Jesus built, he says there in Matthew uh, chapter 16, I will build my church. So it was built by Jesus Christ, not by somebody else. It was built in Palestine and was established in Jerusalem after his ascension. And spread from there. So the, the origin of the church that Jesus built was during the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in Palestine. Not somewhere else. It was not in Rome by Constantine or those that came out of the Roman Catholic Church. So you have the Roman Catholic Church, Constantine, and then Gregory is the first acknowledged true Pope. They didn't have a Pope until Gregory, which is about 600 A.D. Constantine about 300 A.D. And this in Rome. 
of that. It's not the church that Jesus built. It's at least 300 years too late in the wrong place and the wrong founder. Then 1520, you have the Lutheran church established in Germany by Luther. Well, that's over 1,500 years too late. Wrong country, wrong person, wrong doctrine. Because their doctrine was derived, even though they, they protested, that's when they call it the uh, Protestant, they protested the corruptions of Rome. The corruptions of Rome had become so bad that even its own church members protested against it. And they sought to reform the church of Rome. Well, the church of Rome was never the church of Christ to begin with. So any reformation of the church of Rome is still not the church that Jesus built. The Episcopal Church, 1534, came next. That was Henry VIII. He started because the Pope wouldn't give him a divorce. Again, wrong country, wrong time, wrong individual, wrong reason, wrong doctrine. Then you have the Presbyterian Church, a Reformed Church. 1536 A.D., John Calvin, Switzerland. Again, oh, 1,500 years too late, wrong place, wrong individual. Congregational, Robert Brown, 1580. That was in England. Again, wrong place, wrong time. They split off of the Episcopal. Methodist, John Wesley, 1739. Again, England and the U.S. split off of the, the Episcopal Church. And then the Disciples, Alexander Campbell, 1827. Uh, they split off of Presbyterian Church. He was Presbyterian. His father was a Presbyterian minister. They identified somewhat with Baptists at the time but was expelled from the Baptist churches. You know, they rose up in their midst and led away disciples after themselves and became known. And if you count that up, that's seven. That's got your original Protestant Reformation. And the list goes on. And, and the number seven many times is used as a number of completeness. And so... All those who followed in their steps all carry the corrupt doctrine of Jezebel. Uh, Revelation 2.24 Jezebel and those who followed her could not be the church of Christ. Now, we've taken the letters to the seven churches here and let me explain quickly, briefly, my take on this. One, those were seven little churches that existed in the days that John wrote. He wrote to these churches. They existed. They had these issues and things in them. That's number one. That doesn't do us necessarily any good. Number two is I believe they are typical. We've made reference to the fact there's nothing new under the sun. Human nature is the same. The basic issues of life do not change. It doesn't make any difference which generation, you know, what century it is, what country it is. Human nature is the same. Sin is sin. And God hath commanded all men everywhere, not just in America, not just in England, but all men everywhere to repent. We're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so, uh, my point being is that these churches are typical of issues that churches face in any given period of time. And in any generation, any decade, much less any century, uh, churches could read these letters and identify with the things that are in there. But I th believe there is another application of this. And these are all true and valid applications of these letters. And one, the uh, third one is that the Lord spelled out an overview of the history 
between his ascension and his establishment of the church and his return, which the book of Revelation is a revelation of. And he has not left us in the dark, just as in the Old Testament, God gave a very precise timetable when he, he ended with the prophecies. And we talk about that period of silence between the Testaments, 400 years. And there was not a prophet, there was not a new word from God during that time. But he had closed that out with a very specific timetable and explanation of the kingdoms that would rise and fall in that interim. He did not leave his people without that revelation. And I believe he just done the same thing in the New Testament. That he's laid out for us in the scriptures, in these churches, a chronology, if you will, of the course of the churches. And each in each one, you can identify there are those that were faithful and those that were not. Jezebel is that which was not faithful. And in uh, verse 24, but I say unto you, but uh, excuse me, but unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine. Now those who have this doctrine of Jezebel are the false churches. Those who do not are the true. But notice what he says here. Uh, as many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak. So there were some in Thyatira, what they spoke was from the depths of Satan. And sometimes you find individuals within a local church that are teaching something, saying something. That's of the devil. You see. And you have those within that church that don't listen to that. So you can see where this applies to a local church, but it also prophetically uh, applies to a period of time here uh, in history. And so it said, and we will wear our own apparel. Now that's kind of, we will eat our own bread, our own doctrine. And you see how the doctrine was corrupted and it just got worse and worse and worse and people got further and further and further away from the truth and further and further away from what is a, a true New Testament church. Jezebel doesn't know what a true New Testament church is. She thinks she's a, the church or wants to convince people this is the church that Jesus began. Those uh, churches that came out of her want people to think we are the church that Jesus, we're all part of the church that Jesus built. They want to claim legitimacy. And that their teaching should be accepted, but they're, so we'll eat our own bread. As opposed to that which God provides. Bread that God, every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. That's the bread that as a church that we should be feeding on. As true believers, that's what we should be feeding on. Every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Not that which comes from the depths of Satan as they speak. There's a distinction. And we're to use certain discrimination that is discernment to be able to discern between good and evil, right and wrong. There's nothing wrong with discrimination of the right kind. But see, the world wants to convince people don't discriminate about anything. Discrimination is in and of itself. It's evil. It's wrong. Don't do it. So every time we disagree with something, we just have to be quiet. Or else we get labeled as bigots and discriminatory and we're discriminating against this and discriminating against that. I tell you what, when men stand before the judgment seat, they're going to find God very discriminating.
And they can't hide behind man's laws. They can't hide behind popular opinion or political correctness when they stand before God. Because none of those things has any jurisdiction or hold any authority before His throne. We will wear our own apparel. Now, apparel is a type of righteousness or covering for sin. And we see, in addition to the imputed righteousness of Christ, over in Revelation, in, in the context we talk about churches and the doctrine and these seven women desiring a marital arrangement, you know, it's kind of like a prenup, kind of an open relationship. We want to be married for the convenience of it, but you go do your thing and I'll go do mine. That's not marriage. But that is a domestic arrangement, a domestic contract. But that's not marriage in a biblical sense. And that's what they were desiring here. And so... Uh, Romans 10 talk about the Jewish nation but again there's nothing new under the sun this is part of the human condition uh, there's men everywhere th uh, that have this idea uh, being ignorant of God's righteousness they're going about to establish their own righteousness and how many times in the Old Testament and Proverbs don't talk about men that do that which is right in their own eyes and all of their works are righteous in their own eyes and so, being ignorant of what God's righteousness really is, and going about to establish their own righteousness, as a result, they fail or refuse to submit themselves to the righteousness of God, which he says is by faith in Jesus Christ, for he is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Romans chapter 3 Verse 19. Now we know that what things wherever the law saith, it said to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. Now let, let me ask you this. We think about the law and the Ten Commandments that was given at Mount Sinai. It came through Moses. It was delivered to the Jewish people. But now listen to what he says here. To them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. All the world is under that law because it is the law of the Creator. It is universal. And the purpose is to show men their guilt. The law cannot save. The law is holy. It's just. It's good. But it can only condemn. But the purpose is to show us our condemnation. To show us our sin. That we might realize our need to repent. And trust the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. That is the purpose of the law. And the ultimate end goal of the law is love. Love is a fulfilling of the law. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Those things that are contained in the law represent what we do or don't do as a matter of love. And so uh, therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe for there is no difference. We all have sinned and this goes on. We're very familiar, should be very familiar uh, with these verses. Uh, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption as in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, 
to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins. And so on. And so, this is the righteousness that they will not submit to. This is the apparel uh, from the fall in the Garden of Eden. And they attempted to make fig leaves for themselves. This is man's attempt to cover his sin. To cover uh, the guilt and the condemnation. The shame. To cover their shame. Nakedness is a, uh, represents our shame. Our conviction because of our sin. The guilt of sin. And so trusting in themselves that they are righteous. And therefore do not need the imputed righteousness of Christ. But there is another uh, aspect of apparel. Which is the wedding garment. And in Revelation chapter 19. I was reading about the Lord's wife here. Be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. This is not the imputed righteousness of Christ talking about salvation. But this is the wedding garment of the wife. They said, we'll provide our own. We want the name. We want to be called by your name. But we want to provide our own doctrine, our own teaching. We want to provide our own righteousness. We want to provide our own wedding garment. What an insult. And it says to take away our reproach. See, we want our own doctrine. We want our own apparel. But there is a reproach that goes with that. In not submitting to the will and the power of God. The authority of God. There is a reproach that goes with that. Catholic Church has fallen under reproach. Many others have fallen under reproach. That word has to do, it, it's 2781 in Strong's Concordance, Sherpa, the Hebrew word. It means shame, object of reproach, scorn, contempt, connotation of blame, or like pointing the finger. People are pointing the finger at us. We don't like it. We want that taken away. Point the finger and said, That's not the doctrine of Christ. That's not a New Testament church. And they don't like that. Because with that comes a reproach. And so we want that taken away. The hypocrisy becomes apparent, and even the world to which they belong holds them in contempt, as well as the true believers. Now we see in the world today, and this is of the world, this is worldly, and yet the world has contempt for this Christianity. These false churches want to claim status as the churches of Christ, which in reality they have no claim to or no right to. But Christ in His church, notice in our text, the, the second verse, in that day, the branch of the Lord, uh, shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming back in glory. And his church is coming with him. 
And his church also, this is his body, as husband and wife become one, he and his church become one. And that day is going to be made manifest his true New Testament churches as well as those who are genuinely saved and followers of Christ. But notice, if you will, in Psalms 45. Two words. Beauty, beautiful, glorious. Psalm 45 Verse 11. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. And the daughter of Tyre shall be there with the gift. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. Talk about those that are the guests at the wedding. The king's daughter is all glorious within her clothing of wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be brought unto thee with gladness and rejoicing. Shall they be brought, they shall enter into the king's palace. With gladness and rejoicing. What was it we read there in Revelation 19? Be glad and rejoice. That very phrase. The marriage of the Lamb has come. Talking about the virgins, her companions. And so on. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 22. Uh, said, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. You know, that day, in that day, he's going to present as church unto himself, holy, without spot, without blemish, glorious, glorious in beauty. In that day, people will understand, those in heaven will understand that beauty. Notice Revelation 21, verses 1 and 2. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. After the millennial kingdom is over, this heaven and earth has passed away with a great noise and fire and great heat and all that is described in the scriptures. The great white throne of judgment has taken place. So all the wicked have been judged and cast into the lake of fire. He said there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. You know, uh, he talks about the great white throne. He says, I saw a great white throne in him that sat on from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. So this, this heaven and earth that is now will pass away. But then he says that there's a new heaven and a new earth. Verse, 20, uh, verse 1, chapter 21. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now all the saved, this is not heaven, this is the New Jerusalem that came down from God out of heaven. The descriptions of the New Jerusalem is not a description of heaven. Other than the fact that this city exists in heaven and is coming down out of heaven. But this is not the home of all the saved. If it was, you wouldn't need a new earth. 
You wouldn't need a new heaven. The heaven here is that at the the heavens, the sun, moon, and the stars, not the third heaven where God dwells. Um, notice verse nine and ten. He said, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending uh, out of heaven from God. And so we see the new Jerusalem coming down. But notice the description goes on through chapter 22. Um, well, let's see. I know, well, it's still chapter 21. And verse 22 and 23 said, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb were the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. So the nations of the saved, God is redeeming a people unto Himself out of every nation, kindred, tongue, people upon the earth. And they are going to inhabit this new earth. That's why there is going to be a new earth, as a place for them to inhabit. And God's tabernacle, that new Jerusalem, is going to come down and, and He's going to dwell among His people. And they will come in and out of the city. But they're walking in the light of that city. But that city is identified as the bride and the wife. That's where they're going to be. And so, several points there. Not, not everybody that's saved is in the bride. And certainly not every institution that claims to be a church of the Lord Jesus Christ is in fact a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But they all want to claim to be that. And it's up to us as individuals. If you're saved and a believer and would be obedient to the Lord and follow Him, follow Him in scriptural baptism, follow Him in, in the teaching, the doctrine that He has delivered to His churches, this, the faith that was once delivered to the saints, because He has promised that he would preserve his church. I mean, in the Old Testament, even in the worst of circumstances, in the worst of times in Israel, that was established when the kingdom separated. And in the northern tribes under Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who did make Israel to sin because he set up idol worship there. He set up two temples to worship a golden calf. And then at the, the worst of this, when Ahab came in and he married Jezebel, and that's where this comes from, and she brought in the Baal worship and they persecuted the, the people of God, they persecuted the prophets, and, and Elijah thought he was the only one left. He said, they've killed everybody else and now they're seeking my life. And I, I kind of got corrected on this this, this morning because I flipped some numbers and things in my mind. But God told him, said, I have reserved 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. God, even in the darkest of times, through the dark ages, through the, the height and the power of the Catholic Church, as they persecuted and sought to destroy and wipe off the face of the earth, everything that opposed them, that claimed to be the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, God preserved a remnant through all that time. Because He's promised in Ephesians, unto Him, unto God the Father, be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. And so from the time that Jesus was here upon the earth and He established His church, through all the history, all the centuries that have passed, until He returns, there will be true New Testament churches that have not bowed the knee to Baal, that have not bowed to Jezebel till he comes back. And so it is the duty of every believer to seek out scripturally 
that which is a true New Testament church. Now, of course, we believe we are. But you as an individual should have your own conviction as to the truth and veracity of that. The truth and veracity of God's word. And then follow it. Because, he said, there's a day in which seven women are going to take hold of one man and say, we want to be called by your name. We'll provide our own bread and we'll provide our own apparel. But we just, we want your name to take away our reproach. We're in such a day. Let us stand. I, to preach this evening, and, and I had this verse of Scripture kind of laid out intending to teach that when we get down to Kentucky. But uh, anyway, we hope that it's been instructive and informative. We don't teach these things with any malice toward anyone. If there's any malice, it's toward Satan and how he's deceived people and how he's hurt people. But out of a desire to exalt the Lord and His work. Let us stand in hymn number 249.